fellow journalist, architect, and author, Diamond Liu. Where we left off. 
So I wasn't too surprised that they called me late one night in March 2022. But I was alarmed by what he told me. My health is not so good this day, they said. I can't walk anymore. My argument with the Chinese anti tan line has come back to bite me in the butt. I had major surgery on my foot early this year, and sepsis infection spread throughout my body. I have two heart attacks and two strokes, and the doctors say I will never walk again, at least as I define walking. It's okay, I'm found on my feet, they continued. They have tolerated a lot over the last 62 years. But they want to lop off the right one. They had COVID twice. He was about to be homeless in a week. He knew he wasn't long for this world, but he had absolutely no self-pity. The same old Nate. Nate went on to lament the lack of community in American society and he expressed envy at the strength of Asian families. Good things don't just happen on their own, I told Nate. For any community to work, even for family from Asia, someone has to take the initiative to do the right things. How do you do that, Nate asked. It was too email to explain, and it was late. So I said, I will show you. I knew I had to do something. You, won't, you wouldn't want to see a dog dying on the street if you knew about it, let alone a friend. I hide what I have learned trying to free political prisoners. You turn to those close to you and ask for help. And then you expand the circles, one concentric circles at a time. My husband, Bob Sudinger, who's sitting there, sent money directly into the next bank account because his bank balance was zero. So at the very least, they could buy food. Next, I turned to our bingo club, a name given to our China policy group. They responded immediately, even though none of them knew Nate personally, though many knew Nate by his reputation. James Malvinen offered to set up a GoFundMe account and managed it. Matt Pottinger, a former journalist himself, asked how much he should donate. I plan to donate 2000 I said. But really, any amount you want. Matt was the first to donate, and he gave 2000 He set a trend, and the fund quickly reached the target. To my embarrassment, I didn't notice that my credit card promised my $2,000 donation. I had forgotten. I set a limit of $1,500 on my card long ago. A cheap skate habit from my penniless days as a refugee. Next, I reached out to a few journalists who have covered Asia. They Responded quickly too. Marcus Brouchley sent a new iPhone to Nate as Nate lost his at the beach. Malvina patiently walked Nate through setting up the new iPhone and connecting Nate's bank account via the new iPhone to the GoFundMe account. Francis Mariotti offered Nate frequent help driving several hours to visit Nate. 
other journalists contact many more journalists, the concentric circle group. As we gather to celebrate Nay's eventful and colorful life, let us remember Nay as someone who gave journalism a good name. In our troubled times, we need more journalists like Nate, who did not just serve the interests of corporate giants, but most importantly, he served humanity at large. I hope journalists of schools will come to see Nate as a model for the best journalism has to offer and that those who are the owners of media platforms will see what benefits humanity will benefit them too. So here's to Nate, rest in peace.
In October 1992, the State Department and UNHCR came to file our paperwork. One week after, we already got IOM paid. We will go to the United States of America. Net uses all power to let the world to know that the Vigya people were abandoned for a long, long time. No one can to help the Vigya follow in, in the jungle. Mr. Net opened his heart, rescued us from the danger place, and reset us to the new way of life. We they got very, very much respect for him because he is a great man to us. He is saved 400 men and women and children. When we arrived in the USA, Mr. Bai Yun had a problem and passed away on November 2007. I established the Vega Central Highland Organization to continue his legacy of his dream to fight for freedom to the Vega people in the Central Highland of Vietnam. The Vega people are suffering greatly under Vietnam persecution and genocide. Recently on Easter week this year, the Vietnam police Use excessive force against the Vega men and women and children. They guard the pastor everywhere they go in, or arrest them if they go to another relatives for the Easter celebration. Last week on April 2023, the Vega people stood up for protest in the valley of the Pun Mata. The Vietnam have been sent the police troops to stop. The people protest peacefully, but Vietnam government sent a hundred of the police and asked were against them like criminal. Many men they got men and women and children got beat up and even missing. This is it happened to everywhere in the Central Highland. Our land has been taken away and we are pushed into the rocky and unpleasant place in our country. There are more than 1,000 Liga refugees in Thailand. Most of them have been stuck in there 15 to 17 years because up to this point, the United States has shut the door on the Liga refugees. We hope and we ask the United States government to rescue them. We keep asking the government of the United States to not abandon us anymore. We do our best to report it and all activities and events that happen to our people to the State Department. The United States, the United States nation, and everywhere possible to ask for help. We wish that there are more angels like Mr. Matt who have the heart to their people. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Next, we'll hear from Sarah Colm, who edited Nate at the Phnom Penh Post before going on to serve as Human Rights Officer for the UN and Human Rights Watch.
who said he was soft on the Khmer Rouge. Here's what he said. I have been called a puppet lackey, an intelligence operative, a right-wing jerk, a communist sympathizer, and a hopeless drunk. But I have never been called a cream puff, and I resent it. <laughs> Despite, despite the black humor and the bravado, underneath, Nate had a soft heart. And those of us who got to see that, that side of him really had a treasure. I want to tell you a story that shows his side of Nate. Uh, in one of the last exchanges with me, Nate texted me with amazing news. A Montagnier refugee, he tried to tell some 20 years earlier, who he had long feared had been in prison and was possibly dead, had just made contact with him. It was an emotional reunion, and Nate shared the text exchange between himself and the, the Montagnier who um, wanted to basically thank Nate for shelter, sheltering him for those many years before, and to tell him that he was now safe. And Nate was sort of overcome with emotion, and um, you know, they, uh, I think the, the fellow, whose name is Stevie on below, and he's our next speaker, mostly wanted to thank Nate, but Nate was feeling, uh, had felt quite haunted for years about uh, this particular situation because he had sheltered uh, the Montagnard at the Penelope Post offices for months uh, while the UN sort of uh, adjudicated Beyond's refugee claim. But ultimately the UN uh, rejected his uh, claim for asylum and uh, the Montagnard was forced to go back to Vietnam. So, you know, um, the exchange, you know, it, it was quite emotional. Uh, they said he was crying as he wrote back and forth uh, with the person. He was so relieved that the um, person was safe, um, but still sort of overcome with this, this horrible feeling of uh, after some months having to um, sort of a tearful uh, goodbye with the fellow we never saw again. That was a side of Nate that um, many of us uh, didn't often see, and I think that um, despite you know despite the uh, bravado and the, all all the things that people say about Nate is kind of a cowboy, for sure you know he had a soft heart, and for sure uh, despite his fame, he never forgot many of the quote unfamous people he met over the years. Farewell, Nate. Thank you for giving voice to people, otherwise we will remain forgotten by the world. You will not be forgotten, my friend. Thank you. but unsuccessfully to get him asylum in the United States. And now we'll hear from him. Good morning, family and friends. Thank you, Rob, uh, for allowing me to speak about Nate. Uh, this is my honor to speak uh, about uh, Nate. <clears throat> Even those that we met a uh, very short time uh, in Cambodia, uh, my name is Steve Bjorn Malo. Uh, we came to Cambodia because of persecution and oppression in 1994 with uh, two friends. Uh, we came different way, but we met in Phnom Penh. And after for a while, we've been uh, look, uh, looking for some place to stay and uh, seeking the asylum. Uh, 
So why are we waiting result from the United Nations? Uh, we didn't have a place to stay. So we call uh, our people in America, uh, who the group 1992, uh, Pastor Ihini and the group of Peter and So they say that Nate, you need to contact Nate over here. We say, who Nate? We never know anyone. He's American, we don't speak English well. So we read the, the newspaper, we was looking for, and we saw the just word from Pain Post. And then we saw that address over here. And um, so we walked to Phnom Penh Post because uh, we wore flip flops, so we didn't have shoes. Uh, and uh, we knocked the door because we saw the gate, the middle gate, uh, and uh, we knocked and the door came out, Cambodian, and we just exchanged a little bit uh, Cambodian, Cambodian language, and we say, Nate Taylor. And he went inside, and we just didn't wait for long. Nate came out and he said, He saluted. He said, Oh, he's just like, Welcome. So we went there and he talked to me. He said, Come in, come in. I was shocked. I thought that we're gonna, he's gonna interview us, ask us who you are, what you want. But he didn't hesitate. He just asked him, Come. It seemed like we didn't know each other for a long time. So we went inside. He saw with the office, fancy office. It looked, it looked like similar to this one to us. Computers, I never seen computers in my person. And he introduced uh, two ladies, American, beautiful two ladies. I was young, you know, back at that time. <laughs> so, ladies, Kathleen and Carol. Um, I learned it later that Carol is uh, his girlfriend. And Michael Hyde, he was quiet. Uh, Michael Hyde, similar with Bro. He's Michael Hyde, he made you with Bro. He was sitting in the office and yeah. Of course, they talked to us, but we couldn't, you know. And he showed us around and took us to the upstairs. Uh, the room upstairs, three of us stayed in. Was, oh, we were sleeping. We, we were sleeping in the park in the somewhere up there. But now we have a place to stay. And he said that you can stay here yourself, you fear nothing. And uh, he provided us food, uh, everything. So we stayed here. And uh, we stayed here for a while, and he took us to the trip. Uh, one funny thing about the, the trip uh, in the river with the boat, and uh, I think uh, uh, they rented the boat in Cambodia, a tourist company or something. And then they tried to exchange, and the Cambodian company staff went there and talked to us in Cambodian, Khmer. We didn't understand Khmer, and, and he turned, he spoke uh, Khmer. And Cambodian was, was shocked, was frozen, say that you American speak Cambodian, but this look like Cambodian, but they don't speak uh, Cambodians. So he's wow, say that. And then we, was, we had fun, and uh, it was a relief. Uh, and then we stayed here for a while. We still waiting result from United Nations, you and us, you are. And he called me to his office and he showed the videos that he went to the jungle. I said, wow. He was famous. Reason I didn't know him because it's not because I'm ignorant. We we couldn't get uh, uh, free information. We couldn't get any uh, news when I was in Vietnam. So we couldn't until I saw that video. He was in the jungle. For us, the jungle that is the, the dangerous place to be. Even the Mountain people, we couldn't go there. Only the brave, brave soldiers like them could stay there, you know. Everything, enemies attack you, the jungle itself is, is dangerous. But he went there, he used his, uh, it's not just his skill, his talent, to tell the world, but he used his own body, his own person, stay there to prove the world that this troop is still fighting for the freedom, for the people. They are human beings, they deserve for humanitarians. So he did the job beyond his correspondent as a journalist. So he helped those people. He saw the children, he saw the woman, he saw the elderly, he saw wounded soldier without any food, without any aid. So we still fighting, even those that we have this advantage. We have, have no, uh, no munitions, no weapons. We have, have no aid, no hope, but we still fighting because we as human beings, uh, we dream about the freedom. Then Nate, God, we can pray for pastor. Even in the jungle, we have no, when you see picture of him, uh, took uh, when uh, the Sunday service in the jungle. 
So we pray God, so God sent the angel. Sometimes we pray God, we thought God came to help us, but God had, uh, has his angel. And some people say that they have faith, but he has action. He had work to help those people in need. So he helped those people. His voice, he used his uh, talent, his writing to impact the world, to impact the United States. So they brought those children, women came to America. They became successful. Thanks for not crying, but welcome us. And a lot of uh, the children that he saw in the jungle, now they became a business owner. They graduated from college. They get very good pay job. They're successful. Because Nate, Nate as a voice for us. We, did, we couldn't speak, but Nate, he presented us to speak to the world. He, he helped us. That is why when we, uh, and then, uh, go back to us, yeah, we couldn't uh, accept it by United Nations, so we've been sent back uh, to Vietnam. Of course, we're hiding in the, and Nate, that is the question that Nate keeps asking me when we exchange 2016. And we said, yeah, we went high and we spread out everywhere. Two of us made, one couldn't make. Uh, I heard uh, my friend say that uh, police interrogate him, maybe the poison, or the, we couldn't get information about him. So, in 2001, we protest uh, to ask for freedom. Then we fled to Cambodia and, and met Sarah and Kathleen there. It was, it was a great unification. I could imagine. Only one thing that I still regret that I couldn't meet Nate Taylor in person because uh, we have something that he gave me the code and I, re I record that code and I, I, I sold that code but I can't explain it to him how I understood his code that he gave it to me. I wish that he's still alive we can talk about that code to you. And thank you so much again for your rising Nate CV voice for our community. We couldn't imagine when he was, you know, kids. Like I say, uh, like uh, we say, all say that whole village rise the one child. So thank you so much for him. Next, we'll hear from Andrew Sherry, who is Nate's editor for five of the most productive years of his career at the Far Eastern Economic Review, and also served as his midwife to Nate's Pol Pot articles. Thank you, and uh, big thanks especially to um, Nate's family for inviting us to share this moment with you. So yeah, I was uh, Nate's editor for five years in the, in the 1990s, so he used to refer to me as, as Mahout. And he would go to Thailand, no, the guy sits on the back of the elephant, pokes him on the stick. Um, so, uh, but, uh, you know, we also, you know, we, and I knew he was doing good work, but it wasn't until I became his editor that I really came to understand, like, what an amazing reporter he was. The first big investigative piece he brought to me um, was about a Thai businessman named Tank Luma, who uh, Nate had heard was basically financing a third of the Cambodian military budget and using Cambodian military aircraft to transport drugs from the Golden Triangle to the Port of Siena. Now, what made this a real story was that, um, is that Tank Luma had paid for a Cambodian parliamentary delegation to visit uh, the United States and go up and, uh, and visit Capitol Hill. And uh, the proof that Nate got of this, he had a, he had a copy of the, uh, the hotel bill from the Hay Adams Hotel and uh, the credit card <laughs> signed by Ted Boon Ma to pay for their, <laughs> pay for their stay there. So, uh, you know, so not surprisingly, Ted Boon Ma sued the Far Eastern uh, Economic Review uh, because they he included saying that basically the column suspected drug dealer was libeling him. Uh, what Nate managed to do is that he persuaded the CIA bureau chief in some other uh, Asian country, far away, that remain a, a name, to give him the uh, US government watch list of suspected drug dealers, and Ten Buma's name was on it. Case closed. So Nate, uh, you know, as, as uh, you know, when, when the Kerbers allowed Nate to 
be the only journalist to witness the jungle trial. It was not luck. You know, Nate always built relationships over a long time in all kinds of ways. Well, you know, one of, one of the ways he, he built relationships with, with Mayor, Mayor Rouge is that he allowed the Khmer Rouge military chief of staff to actually stay with him on a visit to Bangkok when the Khmer Rouge wanted to go, go and visit bookstores and buy books on human rights law. They were trying to figure out if they could get back into power legally. And uh, they told me that as they were going around Bangkok together, going to different bookstores, the guy kept you know, seeing all these KFCs that were around Bangkok. <laughs> and finally, I asked him, he's like, hey, who is that man? And he's like, well, that's, that's Colonel Sanders. <laughs> and the guy's like, he must be a very important man. <laughs> Now, um, as, as uh, you know, Sarek and undoubtedly testified, Nate uh, would file like a lot of copy, like reams and reams of impeccably reported copy, but it was very lengthy and uh, and you know often re repetitious. And you know the jungle trial score was you know was no different. But you know I filed it, and you know I did my thing pulling together the sidebars and getting ready. But you know the main bar, the eyewitness account, nobody could do that writing except for, for Nate. And I remember spending a restless night in a uh, hotel room near the review offices in Causeway Bay in Hong Kong, you know, because we had basically told the whole world we were going to have this exclusive scoop, but we still didn't have the main bar <laughs> the day we were supposed to go to press. But, uh, you know, that morning at 7.30, uh, you know, I, email comes in and there's this beautifully crafted eyewitness account and it's just like sighed with relief, like, he did it, he did it. Still, you know, when the, when the interview story um, came out, I didn't take any chances. Uh, you know, I, I just I just got on a plane to Bangkok and holed up with them in the review office. So this was this was another exclusive. Despite the efforts of a uh, New York Times reporter to follow him to the uh, rendezvous point on the way, that New York Times reporter encountered teenage Khmer Rouge soldiers with automatic weapons, and as Nate said, they didn't know. Who the New York Times was, and if they did, they wouldn't have given a shit. <laughs> so he got in, he got the exclusive. Now the problem was, you know, like he came back and did this fantastic interview, but I, I don't know if this is, you know, the story, but at one point he thought he was being poisoned because he felt sick, and he reached over across the table and he grabbed Pol Pot's water glass and he just slurped the whole thing down, and he said he felt better. <laughs> so, um, but to tell you the truth, he was not in great shape that uh, that week. You know, he got back with all this great video. He promptly like just collapsed on the uh, on the couch in the uh, you know in, in the review office. But thanks to Asia Works, I guess I had all this great video to work with. So I just started putting together the stories, and I just had to run and pass Nate to you know Nate to review it. And then years later, he says to me. Sherry, I know exactly what was going through your mind. I was like, what? Like, you were saying, if Nate dies now, will I have enough to finish the story? <laughs> <laughs> and I admit it, as you journalists won't be surprised to know, that is what was going through my mind. But look at who the accuser was, right? This is a guy who decided to go across multiple uh, you know, battle lines to test, basically, because there was supposedly a these fires in place, and he wanted to test it, and you know he, he only survived that running over the anti-tank mine because he was in one of these Russian-made trucks where the engine block is in the front and the seats are on top of the engine block, and that was what what stopped the blast of the anti-tank mine from killing him and killed the two people right next to him. Um, so you know he was criticizing me for being too relentlessly focused on journalism, but there's no there was nobody more relentlessly focused on journalism than Nate. Now, look, you know, that, that approach, it didn't always serve Nate well. When he, you know, got back, when he was back in Maryland and he was working on his book, he was just determined to write day and night. And he persuaded a local doctor to prescribe anti amphetamines for him so he could just work and work more. And then he just, it just triggered like a psychotic episode. And so I was down there basically trying to show him that, you know, Carol had not bugged his uh, computer and phone and nothing like this was going on. And he still didn't believe it until he said one day he looked out the window and he saw Viet Cong guerrillas approaching the house. And he's like, this can't be true. My mind is playing tricks 
on me. So ultimately, it was Nate's journalistic skepticism that snapped him back <laughs> out of that and left him with a good story to tell. All right. So Nate used to refer to himself as the black sheep of, of his family. Well, listen, there's no question that the Boston Bears are amazingly you know, accomplished uh, with a real record of service, whether it's an you know, ambassador like um, you know, like Nate's father, uh, Deputy Secretary of State, like his uh, cousin, uh, aid worker. But, you know, I think all of us recognize is that service was what Nate devoted his life to as well. Yes, he was about great stories, but the reason he was chased, he chased them was because he just couldn't stand it when ordinary people were being screwed over, whether it was by a genocidal dictator, uh, you know, neo-Nazis or, you know, local, local government bureaucrats, and he would just, he would fight for them, and that's what he did. He was a, he was a great man and a great friend. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from M.P. Noonan, a photojournalist and friend of Nate's who took the photograph of him and his dog, Lamont, on the back of the program. I remember the first time I met Nate in Phnom Penh. I was 23 and just starting out on my own path toward becoming a journalist. A bunch of us were standing around outside the little village of prefab containers that served as office space at the UN headquarters waiting to be let in for a press conference. And I said something like, hi, I'm MP, and I don't think we've met. There were gasps around me. Astonished colleagues turned and stared, saying, you don't know Nate? <laughs> His reputation from up on the border had preceded him. Years later in Cape Cod, <laughs> Nate told me once how surprised he was that people used to find him intimidating. I thought, are you kidding? Besides the gasps he provoked, he was tall, he was fit, he was broad-chested, he had a shaven head, he was soft-spoken, and when you asked him who he worked for, as I eventually did that day, the answer was fear. <laughs> as everyone in this room knows, that stands for the Far Eastern Economic Review. But the double entendre was a vibe that worked for him. We know he wore it well doing the hard yards with the Khmer Rouge and making the inroads that no one else had. Six postings later now, I often think of how the press corps functions as a tribe in the most positive sense, the shared purpose of journalism, the camaraderie of working in the situations we do, covering the events we cover. Nate and my friendship became cemented over the years as members of that tribe and also through our shared losses of people like Stefan Ellis and Jamie Factor, Kathleen O'Keefe, remembered as indelible parts of our experience as Nate will be now. As we know, Nate had an anti-authority streak and a real affinity for bad guys. His desire to hold them accountable and to call them out was at times tinged with just a little bit of admiration, not for the slaughter, but for the daring, the willingness to break history's rules. That's part of the reason he focused on Pol Pot, on Teng Bun Ma and Hun Sen, on the North Koreans and the like. It was about being the one to write a new page of history. Nate's life in Cape Cod was much, much smaller than Cambodia and Thailand days because of his health issues and PTSD. He still believed in journalism and his reporting turned to outing white supremacists and neo-Nazis on his blog. I was there once when the FBI called and Nate routinely took calls on speakerphone. They clearly followed Nate's reporting and just wanted a friendly chat. Uh, Nate didn't believe journalists should collaborate with authorities, so he would be mad at me for saying this, I was sworn to secrecy, but uh, he did give the FBI a little bit of extra info on one person he'd written about because he was genuinely afraid that man was gonna be a mass shooter. Uh, the subjects of Nate's reporting were clearly worried. Uh, I read the online threats to Nate's life, and probably worse in Nate's mind, the threats to Lamont, his dog, by neo-Nazis for having been exposed. <laughs> I was there another time when Nate put on speakerphone for me a harassing phone call he got by some anonymous bad guy who felt threatened. 
Uh, this brings me to the last thought I want to share you with. Decades after that day, my friend Nate and I met for the first time in Phnom Penh, and as diminished as his life had become, when it came to reporting, Nate's vibe was still all about intimidation and fear, and he wore it well. Oh. Now we'll hear from Nate's friend and fellow journalist, journalist uh, Rataveri Dong. Alex, um, because he wants to be a 
your journal, they said, don't do that, do international relations, become a lawyer or whatever. But then, that was really a mistake to hand him over all those articles because now he did the video and I was alarmed. I thought I had beaten him off the path. He said, well, because of name now and how, how remarkable and how much he had impact in my life, I really want to become a journalist. He said, oh, no. <laughs> so we passed on the torch. So thank you, Tara. Thank you, David, his dad. You gave him the right examples, and my son, I hope, will not be a journalist. That's <laughs> all. <laughs> Masterfully torturing State Department officials of all political persuasions for the Associated Press. He was one of Nate's colleagues and friends in Cambodia during the tumultuous 1990s. Hi, all. Good morning or afternoon, I guess it is now. Uh, I'll try to be very brief because I know we're kind of running late. So um, I came into this whole thing a little bit late. I was not there for UNTAC in Cambodia. Uh, I arrived in 1994 um, in, in, in June. Uh, the first time I met Nate was a, one or two days after, after I had arrived, and it was on the street outside the Rock Hard Cafe. <laughs> so if any people remember, remember that, just down the street from where the FCC then became. Uh, and I introduced myself because Nate I had known uh, about. Uh, he was basically a kind of a living legend, particularly among wire service uh, people. Um, uh, his work with the AP on the, on the border was uh, quite well known. Uh, he taught me uh, my first three phrases in Khmer. Uh, Sabai, Samoy Kit, meaning this is how you order another drink in the bar. <laughs> and some cat boy. Uh, let's, may I have the check, please? Uh, he, while a bit gruff, um, I got to uh, be friends with him and uh, also with Michael. And I'm sorry that uh, Michael's video wasn't able to be shown. But, uh, uh, you know, I spent a lot of time over at the Conference Post house uh, on afternoons doing crosswords with, uh, uh, with, with, with Michael and Nate, and uh, uh, they were all uh, adventurous. <laughs> they were great times uh, to be had. So I worked, though, uh, when I first got there, I worked for the Cambodia Daily, which is, of course, the arch rival of the Penelope Post, which uh, Nate co-published his stuff in uh, the Post and in, uh, in the Review. And we at the Daily lived in absolute and abject fear terror, actually, of what the next issue uh, of either was going to bring in terms of, uh, in, in, in terms of news about Cambodia. Uh, Nate, from his time on the border, had great contacts and sources in, uh, in the KPLNF, and Funtenpec, uh, and of course the DK, the Khmer Rouge. Um, uh, and then after he got to Cambodia, he also had some pretty good sources in the CP. Um, not all of whom were uh, huge fans of Hun Sen, although that has, that has changed. Um, the one main memory that I want to uh, share uh, is of the day that the Far Eastern Economic Review story, Nace interview with Paul Pot came out. And I happened to be in Bangkok with Michael Hayes. Uh, and we ended up with Nate at a bar called the Crown Royal. And I don't know if anyone remembers that from. Uh, Never been there. Uh, <laughs> that's right. Well, it's the safe bar in Patapon, right? It's not. It's not. It's not. A, but anyway, uh, and there are there are some Polaroid pictures of, uh, of that night. We're all sitting around a table. Uh, Evan Williams from Australia, maybe C, was there. Nate's lawyer at the time, Michael, and, and, and it is indelibly uh, imprinted in my mind. And 
to it was just it was a wonderful time. And there's a picture of us all holding up the uh, copy of the review, which Andy Sherry had edited uh, the, the story of, and it was uh, quite uh, you know it was just really uh, an amazing uh, an amazing time and an amazing uh, event. Uh, I'll leave you with two words of wisdom that uh, Nate gave to me. Um, one was shave your head, which uh, is advice that I did not take and now I'm regretting it. So sorry. <laughs> and the second thing is that after I was shot and, and, and wounded uh, during the in the very uh, beginning stages of the 19 of the coup in 1997, uh, I ran to Nate <laughs> and he said, Matt, there are very few things that can be better for a young reporter's reputation and career than to be non-fatally wounded. <laughs> he had experience with that, obviously. Uh, it was true. And, and, and I'll, leave, I'll just leave you with that. Nate, rest in peace. You will be missed by everyone. Thank you. Thank you for everyone who have contributed your thought, your mind, and your spirit. I think all of this and your heart will be a blessing to you and all the here. What you give good heart, um, Nate Taylor has been tribute for all. And let me together stand, I will play blessed. And let God go with you all. In the name of the Father, in the name of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, God, come to bless all this, man and woman of you. They are deserved, one in the one. More have strong belief, faith, and to save the life you mentor. Many suffer. Without voice to say call, and who can hear them? If without who cannot hear them, how can we get safe? This is the bless for all this. All the people come today and study more and to do it more and to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ to save the life like you do in the world. And we will do this for again, again, together in time that Jesus is coming again in the name of the Lord. Amen. 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 Be peace and the Lord. Okay, well, thank you all. Um, Sorry about the technical difficulties. We will thread those in um, into the video uh, for everyone to see at a later date on YouTube. Uh, special thanks to Rob Thayer, Sarah Holm, Linda Thayer for making this event possible. Lance Woodruff and MP Noonan, um, who are both here today for their photographs in the program. Uh, Pastor Ehan Nee for his blessings. And we hope you can stay for refreshments and feel free to wander um, on this floor and the floor below. Thank you.